Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, uh, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. It's great to see uh, that everybody's starting to log in from various parts of the world today, and we're happy to see um, some of you for the second day in a row now. Uh, we hope that many of you were able to join um, our session yesterday, TCFD 101. Uh, and as a reminder, TCFD is a task force for climate related financial disclosures. Um, so today, um, building on what we discussed about yesterday, which was really supposed to be an introduction of where the TCFD came from, um, why it was developed, and how you can um, start to make use of the guidance in the TCFD's recommended disclosures, um, we're now today going to build some more experience and look at um, a bunch of examples and case studies and see what this looks like in practice. Um, now, um, as with yesterday, just a reminder, today is a, um, a collaborative effort. Um, we've been working jointly on this training program for some time now with IFC as well as CDP. And so I'm going to um, pass the word over to Relitza to get us started today. Um, Relitza is, uh, uh, is in corporate governance, and she runs the IFC Disclosure and Transparency Program at IFC. Uh, over to you, Relitza, to get us kicked off today. Uh, thank you very much, Tiffany. It's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, today again with uh, so many participants and uh, our over the 60th uh, training uh, on the topic of uh, uh, climate disclosure. Uh, I just want to say a few words to thank for the collaboration to uh, UNSSC and uh, CDP on this uh, important uh, topic. And uh, we are uh, looking forward to uh, continue uh, this uh, collaboration and to go uh, in a deeper today into uh, the topics of uh, climate disclosure and the different pillars of the uh, TCF, uh, TCFD. This topic is particularly important uh, for IFC as an investor in emerging market, which is part of our due diligence uh, uh, processes uh, uh, and uh, also uh, a part of our uh, work collaborating with stock exchanges, regulators, uh, consulting uh, companies, associations, and investors in emerging uh, markets. Uh, uh, so we are are working to build the capacity uh, as well uh, um, with the businesses uh, and improve the environment in uh, in this area. So looking forward for another uh, fruitful training today. Thank you, Tiffany. Thanks very much, Relitza. And as you say, we are kind of evolving in this space. And while we've been training for quite some time on TCFD, um, we're now getting a lot of questions about how this relates to upcoming standards um, from the International Sustainability Standards Board of the IFRS Foundation. So we've asked uh, our good partners at the ISSB to come and provide kind of setting the stage of how the TCFD then leads into the ISSB. So I'm going to pass over to uh, Mike Simoni, uh, the Policy and External Affairs Director um, at ISSB. Over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Tiffany. And thank you very much once again to both uh, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, CDP and IFC for hosting these wonderful sessions. And hopefully yesterday, you saw how the TCFD was really born out of the work of many reporting organizations, you know, the CDP, CSB, SASB and others. And this is really what's happening with the ISSB as well. It's not a revolution, it's an evolution. And just like um, we at the ISSB have really taken the work that was already out there and evolved it to bring it to the, to the next level, uh, the same is happening, hopefully, with 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 your preparation for reporting. You started perhaps with with your CDP response, then you started incorporating this information into an annual reporting to the TCFD, and really the next step is to sort of evolve that again to the ISSB to use the, the ISSB standard. So, I'm, I just wanted to repeat my message that I said yesterday as well. You're exactly in the right place to be ahead of the game and to be prepared for what's coming next. So again, wish you a very productive session and, um, and wish you a good day. Bye.
Thanks so much, Mike. And just before we dig straight into the training, we wanted to um, just share a message from CDP um, as well. Um, we do have a recording because Sue couldn't be with us today. So those of you who were here yesterday have already heard this message. Please bear with us. Um, Sue Armstrong Brown is the Global Director in, of Environmental Impact and Thought Leadership at CDP, who is, of course, our partner on this training as well. And she really helps to set the scene of um, how we're moving forward um, with this topic. So um, I'm going to ask yeah great we're going to play the thanks message very now. much tiffany and um, thanks for the the introduction and hello to everybody it's wonderful that we've got so many people here from all over the world um as tiffany says my name is sue Armstrong brown i'm the global director of environmental impact and thought leadership at cdp which is the longest job title in the world but it basically just means that my area of of the work oversees the development of the disclosure content um, and the environmental uh thinking and leadership that goes into it um, as many of you know, CDP is the not-for-profit that runs the global disclosure system for investors, companies, city-states and regions to manage their environmental impacts. Um, it's brilliant that, that we're doing this and it's lovely to be here and I'd really like to express my gratitude to our partners at the IFC and UNSSE. It's been a pleasure um, for us to work alongside you um, and to provide this really high quality capacity building on TCFD climate disclosure to markets around the world. Um, and I don't know if it's already been said, because I'm afraid I joined slightly late, um, but we've trained together over 15,000 participants and over 50 stock exchanges, which is, is fantastic to see those numbers going up. And I hope will lead to even greater advancements in climate disclosure as we keep going forward. CP's mission is to drive transparency in action to tackle environmental crisis. And in line with this, we've always been supportive of the development of impactful and high quality disclosure standards and frameworks because they provide the clarity and increase compliance and support companies in their reporting needs and tcfd has really served as a remarkable bridge touching financial interests and understanding across the broader environmental goals so the finalization of the issb climate standard marks a really important transition for markets as we move from tcfd to the issb Last autumn at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, CDP and ISSB announced that CDP would incorporate the ISSB's climate related disclosure standard into our global environmental disclosure system. And we see this as a, as a major step towards more transparency, accountability and efficiency within the financial markets. Um, and it's a step towards implementing the idea of a global baseline for climate reporting, which is why we're so excited about it. We are the, um, the independent global environmental disclosure system and last year over 18,700 companies, which is worth half of global market capital disclosed climate data to us. So we can see the scale when we start to implement some of these standards um, and provide that, that common platform. And it does mean CDP is uniquely positioned to scale the adoption of the ISSB climate standard across the global economy. So we would like to see the integration of this into our questionnaire to it as a part of accelerating rapid early adoption of the climate standard in practical terms our disclosure system has been aligned with tcfd recommendations since 2018 um, which the issb is rooted in so the climate standard builds on the four pillars that tiffany mentioned and these pillars and recommended disclosures are and will continue to be operationalized through our disclosure platform for many years cdp has worked to facilitate the building blocks of a comprehensive reporting um, framework to advocating for a shared goal of a harmonized set of global reporting standards that will truly support corporates to disclose in the most meaningful and relevant ways. Our disclosure platform helps to support implementation of these high quality regulations and standards that we're starting to see emerging. But we don't want to stop there. CDP will continue to go beyond the foundations required by policy and we want to embody best practice in environmental disclosure so that by reporting to CDP, corporates, financial institutions and cities, states and regions are preparing themselves and getting support to be the leaders in the global transition towards a net zero economy that works for people and planet, which is what we all want to see. As we know, climate change is an issue that can't be solved by any single entity element or country and unlike many other challenges facing society today climate change requires more than a fair approach and a good partnership it demands active transition and tcfd and the issb are some of the most effective tools in that effort and the building of capacity to use them through activities like this training is urgent and vital there can't be any collaboration to solve this crisis without a common basis so i really hope that these trainings are valuable for you 
whether you're just starting or whether you're far along your disclosure journey. And we at CDP are available to support you at all stages of your journey. Once again, I'm very grateful that you've joined us from all parts of the world and for the work that we're doing together with our partners. I hope this web webinar will work for you and bring you the knowledge that you're hoping for. Thank you. Great. So with that, I hope we kind of have set the scene um, building on yesterday's training where we did cover, um, as Sue mentioned, the four core pillars of the TCFD and also the TNFD and now moving into the ISSB. So we really want to understand now in practice, how do we implement governance strategy, risk management metrics and targets in our disclosures and how do we share that with our report um, users? Just as a reminder, um, there's two of us here today with you to facilitate your training. Sorry, Evan, your, um, your title has not been um, updated since our earlier trainings, but um, today with us, you do have Evan Guy from CDP and myself um, from the UNSSE initiative. Um, we are going to cover um, quite a bit of content today. Evan, you know, just need to get, there we go, thanks. Um, so just a quick overview of what we're looking to cover um, in the first um, nearly, uh, for, well, probably a little bit more than the first hour, we're going to take that deep dive into the TCFD's recommended disclosures, those four core pillars, and we're going to look at what good practice looks like, I show you some examples and discuss how we could even improve on some of those examples. Um, just like yesterday, for those who joined us, we will aim for about a five minute break halfway through let you take a stretch, grab a coffee. And then in the second uh, half of today's session, we're going to return to those implementation steps we were discussing yesterday. We're going to discuss what does it look like to get this off the ground and can, some key challenges that companies normally face when they're doing that. We will do an exercise together um, again, where we'll be looking at um, three different reporting examples and discussing how they could be improved or what you might want to use in your own disclosure. And as with um, yesterday, we'll leave you with a number of resources as you continue on your journey. Uh, short housekeeping. Um, uh, for those who were here yesterday, you all caught on very quickly. Please do make sure to use the Q&A box to ask your questions. Um, as you can see, um, with a large number of participants, the chat box can sometimes move very quickly and it's difficult for us to follow. So if you do put your questions in the Q&A box, we can make sure that we um, tackle all of your questions. We do have a great team here working with us to help us tackle those questions. So um, as with yesterday, you might've got your questions answered by uh, Ralit or by um, uh, IPERI or by my UN uh, SSE colleague, Benina, or by Bianca from CDP. So please feel free to ask us whatever questions you have, and we will endeavor to get you um, the answers and resources you need moving forward. We also will be sharing all presentation materials with you at the end of the session, um, along with a feedback survey. Um, most of you hopefully are familiar with this now because hopefully you were with us yesterday. Um, but just so you know, here's the Q&A box on the top. Um, that's where you should ask your questions. And then um, down below, we're talking about the chat function there. And that's where you can, you know, converse with your with your fellow participants. Or um, if you're concerned about any logistical issues, you can um, share that with us there. But if you have a, a question you really want us to answer, make sure that ends up in your Q&A box. Um, everybody is um, currently muted. Uh, if we do have time for Q&A at the end, um, then we will um, allow you to raise your hand and then we can unmute you for asking a question. Um, so this is now the second prong of our TCFD training program. So yesterday we were focused on getting started with climate related uh, financial reporting in TCFD 101, the introductory session. Now today, TCFD 102 is focusing on more um, a deep dive and building experience, looking at what this actually looks like in practice in, uh, in corporate reports. Um, at the end of today's session, we're going to point you towards where you can continue your learning journey, and uh, we'll show you how to make use of the TCFD Knowledge Hub, where you can use self-guided online learning uh, to continue to learn on uh, various aspects of TCFD. So today, 
Three key learning objectives again. Uh, first, we hope to help you build a more detailed understanding of the TCFD's recommended disclosures and how to achieve practical implementation uh, and alignment with those recommendations. As we've uh, discussed a few times now, this aligns with the movement into ISSB, so this really helps you to prepare for the next set of standards. Um, in the second instance, we're hoping to help you understand what good practice looks like through the use of case studies and examples. Um, and then finally, we hope to help you to identify what are those internal processes that you need to uh, implement in order to support climate risk and opportunity reporting in your organization. And of course, how to overcome those common implementation challenges that we see. Um, a useful resource for you um, as we get started, um, the SSE model guidance can be used as a reference tool, um, both for um, organizations and their stock exchanges. Today, we're going to focus on uh, specifically chapter three, which is disclosure content, and chapter four, which is disclosure presentation and validation. Um, so if you would like to review this content afterwards, you can use the SSE model guidance and check out those chapters. Oops, I skipped past our poll. There we go. Um, so just to get us started, um, we would just like to know a little bit about where you're at on your TCFD journey and what you're struggling with most. So which of the TCFD core elements do you find to be uh, most challenging to implement in your organization? And as you fill that out, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Evan, who's going to take you through the next uh, session. Over to you, Evan. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tiffany, and thank you all for coming back to, to join us today. Um, I'll just give everyone another moment or two to fill out that poll. Wonderful. Looks like see most of you filling that in. Um, and it's a pretty sort of even split across a lot of these. Um, definitely metrics and targets is uh, the winner for the one that's most challenging. Um, great, that's not a problem at all. Uh, we're gonna go through a sort of series of case studies. And so hopefully, <clears throat> whether you selected you that you're having issues with governance or metrics and targets or, or, or if it was strategy, hopefully through these case studies, we can sort of clarify any challenges that you might be having and if we haven't done so, please, please go go ahead and ask questions in, in the Q&A and hopefully we can, can clarify that because we're gonna go through these sort of pillars one by one with case studies. Um, but before we get into the case studies, I wanted to review um, a slide um, that we saw from um, our last presentation. Um, Tiffany went over this, but to remind you, just because it's so important, all of the pillars, TCFD pillars, are interlinked. The governance, the strategy, the risk management metrics and targets, that's why it's in this sort of onion diagram. And they should work together and really be tackled as holistically as possible because good governance of climate-related issues really set the framework. Strategy then flows from this framework. Strategy is based on appropriate risk management, and it's all underpinned by effective metrics and targets. And so these issues should not be dealt with in silos. And we went over a suggested three-phased approach yesterday where you can start with different areas of the TCFD and build them out together at the same time. But just because we're gonna go through each of these pillars one by one, I just really, really wanted to emphasize the importance of tackling these holistically. And that leads us to our uh, first example, our first case study for today, which comes from the company Lendley's. Uh, who has decided to approach its disclosure process in this sort of phased but continued way, showing that activities under different pillars can be carried out in conjunction with one another. Lendleys has taken this approach where they have started governance and strategy, and then later moved on to the metrics and targets and pillars. Um, but the company doesn't stop with some of the initial work, for example, the governance work after the first year. They carry this on through subsequent years, really build out and expand these areas of the TCFD together so that each part is really strengthening and reinforcing the others. And for each um, core TCFD core element, Lendley's reports transparently on their progress that includes the actions that they've taken both in the reporting year and those that they have planned in the future to really 
give a reader of this report an idea of where they're at and the direction they're going with this work. So hopefully that sort of makes that uh, approach a bit clearer. Um, but with that, I'd like to get into sort of the first core pillar, that governance pillar um, of the TCFD. And this pillar is really about an organization's approach to governing climate risks and opportunities, both at the board and management levels. Now, the reason why investors want to know about this is that they really want to understand the context in which a company approaches and embeds financial risks into its operations in terms of the structure and overall approach to the topics. And particularly, investors want to see that the proper level of attention is being given by the board and management to really factor these issues into their decision making and operations. The, the fir first um, disclosure requirement under that governance pillar is to describe the role of the board in overseeing climate related issues. Um, so here it's important to consider including a discussion on the processes and frequency by which the board considers climate change. So for example, are there particular board committees that focus on the topic or consider it? How often is the item of climate change on their agenda? And what exact role within the board do, the, do these committees play? For the overall board um, beyond committees, you'll want to disclose information on whether the board considers climate related issues when reviewing strategy, risk management policies, major expenditures, how are these climate risks and opportunities being factored into those decisions? How does the board monitor and oversee progress against targets for addressing climate related issues? And what is the specific role of the board in doing this? The second aspect, um, the second of the two main sort of pillar, um, recommended disclosures under that governance pillar um, moves from the board to management. And so um, on this next slide, we'll see that the second aspect of governance is really looking at that role of management in assessing and managing climate related issues. So the TCFD refers to management quite broadly as any level of senior governance below the board level. So it's important to keep that in mind. But here it's important to consider including information on um, what specific individual roles and committees and functions are that have oversight over climate at a management level. Um, now, you don't need to include the, the specific name of the specific person, but the what role within the organization, what title, what position um, really is actively involved in climate. Um, what exactly do these individuals do? How do they fit together within the overall organizational structure? How are they kept informed of climate related issues that have to do with their role? How do they monitor climate related issues and performance measures that they might be considering and then crucial last but certainly not least how are management and the board connected how does management inform board decisions and how are board decisions then communicated to the management and you may remember from lot from our training sessions yesterday that one of the real benefits that comes from T tcfd disclosure is stronger connections between management and the board on climate and here's where you can really demonstrate that this is working and leading to a more resilient company another um, sort of case study that we can have a look at to sort of illustrate this comes from uh, the company legal in general so here we see quite clearly on the left hand of the side there is a disclosure of the governance structure that's outlined visually, including um, the committees and group environment committee, outlining what role this committee plays in setting metrics and targets around climate, assessing risk and having general oversight over strategy and considering climate within it. Uh, on the other side of the uh, slide, we see the roles and responsibilities for each of the relevant committees really broken down into sort of narrative description outlining these roles and responsibilities. Um, so this is a good sort of example to look to. I particularly like both the sort of the visual, um, the visual 
sort of aid to help you really understand where these rules sit within the organization, where these committees sit within the organization as well, accompanied by that sort of narrative description. So this is a good example to look to. The second pillar of the TCFD is around strategy. And this really looks at the sort of actual, the, 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 the risks of climate change and opportunities and the potential impacts of those climate related risks and opportunities on an organization's businesses, strategy and financial planning, where this information is material and how that's being strategically addressed. And what matters particularly to investors here is the alignment of the risks and opportunities that are being identified as material to the company's wider strategy. So here, um, it's important to show the alignment of um, the company's business model with a low carbon or a carbon constrained future and the goal that it wants to achieve in that respect. Another aspect that um, falls under the strategy pillar is that of scenario analysis that's really used to show the resilience of an organization's strategy to various different climate scenarios, which I will go into more detail. So for those of you who thought um, have been struggling with the strategy pillar, um, hopefully I can clarify any questions you might have, but please do ask along the way as we go through here. But the first requirement under the strategy pillar is for the organization to describe the climate related risks and opportunities that it has identified over the short, medium and long term. So what particular risks and opportunities do you see from climate change? Um, and you might remember from um, last, last session that we really stressed the importance of attaching um, time values to these time horizons. So what does short, medium, and long-term term mean for your organization? Um, and we got a question about this. Is there an official definition? Um, no, the time horizons will vary depending on your organization's particular situation. But what is really crucial is that you are defining what you mean when you say um, short, medium, and long term, and what those risks are and opportunities are that are material over each of those time frames, and what processes you have um, to determine if they have a financial impact. Um, and I think with this one, it's important to sort of really remember and think back to those sort of look at looking at both the sort of physical um, and transition risks that we spoke about in our last session and really sort of outlining and considering all of those that can be material to your organization. The second um, recommended disclosure under this strategy pillar is then once you've identified those risks and opportunities that can be material to your organization is to describe the impact of those climate related risks and opportunities on your organization's businesses, strategy and financial planning. So the goal here is really connect those, those risks and opportunities that have been identified to the company's strategy and think about it from a strategic and financial sense in your reporting. So some of the areas that are important to consider, uh, including information on here are, how will the impacts from climate change affect your products and services? What are the expected impacts on your supply and value chain? How does this um, play out in terms of different climate mitigation and different climate adaptation activities? How might it be informing your overall investment into research and development? And then finally, also crucially, um, how do you see these impacting your operations? So particularly here clarifying the context in terms of the particular types of operations and the locations of facilities that you may expect to be impacted from climate change. For those of you who have operations in multiple different countries, the impacts in one country are likely going to be drastically different than um, the impacts in another country. And even within a country, you see the sort of risk exposures and impacts significantly varying. So it's important to think through these contexts in contextual consideration. But to make this a bit clearer and a bit more concrete, um, let's have a look at an example. Here, uh, we have a, an example from CIMB. As you can see here, the company has highlighted um, 
types of risks in line with these PCFD risk types. So you have um, transition risks such as policy and legal risk, technology risk, market risk, reputational risk, um, as well as um, physical risks. Tiffany sort of gave us a sort of distinction between acute and chronic risks. We see CIMB here really breaking those down, considering those, considering the examples, and then um, considering the potential transmission channels and how those transmission channels could lead to a financial impact on the company. Um, on a separate page, these financial risks are connected to specific time horizons for which um, those impacts may, may manifest, which those risks may turn into impacts. So this is a, an, another good example um, to look at in terms of how to start approaching your um, strategy disclosures. Another case study that we have comes from uh, Deloitte in their TCFD report, um, which shows the climate related risks and a description of impact that they can expect. And particularly, I think what's great about this is we see them just on this slide honing in on a sort of physical risks here, but they actually identify a sort of financial value and the financial implications of those risks and really shows that process where they're risks are identified, the material risks are selected, and then there's a clear assessment of potential financial impacts and how these are connected to the strategy. So this is a um, great level of detail that they've gotten into in this disclosure. And again, a really good, good example to look at. Perfect. So we've gone through the first two recommended disclosures under the strategy pillar. Uh, now we've gone to the third and final under element under the strategy pillar, uh, that very tricky one that many companies often struggle with, uh, which is to really take in consideration the resilience of your organization's strategy under a range of different climate scenarios. This is often referred to as the scenario analysis recommended disclosure. So um, here it's important to consider including discussion of how does your business use climate related scenarios to inform your business strategy and financial planning? How do you consider these scenarios will play out over different time frames? And what are the implications for business in terms of the different policies, trends, energy pathways that will affect the way in which these scenarios play out for your business? Now let's dive into a bit more detail on this topic. Um, hopefully clarify any questions that you may have. Um, so it's important to say that scenario analysis is really a method for developing strategic plans that are more flexible and more robust to a range of possible future states. And what's important here is it's about looking at alternatives and really trying to look beyond business as usual for strategic planning. A scenario will be a pathway that a business sees as plausible, but it does not necessarily have to be a pathway that it expects to see or sees, sees as desirable. It is about seeing those potential alternatives. And this makes scenario analysis a really critical tool to, to think carefully about climate change and how it's unique implications for your organizations. And what's important to say here is that there's no exact right or wrong when it comes to scenario analysis. And again, it's not about predicting any sort of future performance, much less coming up with an exact prediction of a future state, but to be flexible and to be adaptable. Um, and so that's the sort of real goal behind the scenario analysis piece here. Now, at this stage, this still might sound a bit abstract and a bit intimidating, and you might be asking, are we asking you to be climate scientists to be able to do this, to have a PhD in climatology? Uh, no, of course not. This is not the idea behind this recommended disclosure or the TCFD and what it's getting at. Um, there are a series of already designed uh, and well-established scenarios that we're here to give you sort of information on. Through these, you'll see that there are many different ways that climate change can play out over the next century. And most of them will depend on how we react and what actions we start taking now. 
So for example, a very ambitious scenario that the world is trying to achieve is uh, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees as sort of agreed to in the Paris Agreement back in 2015. Um, this is a possible scenario, but would require very drastic emissions reductions in the short term and strong continued action over the coming decades. Uh, whereas on current policies, we're something on track for something closer to, to three degrees of warming. So what scenario analysis is useful for is to think about these different pathways. For example, this may have um, implications for what a company's emissions target may be under these different scenarios. Or what is what energy mix might there be under a 1.5 degree scenario as opposed to a current policy scenario. Under both scenarios, there's likely going to be a lot more renewable energy in the mix. And so what does that mean for you and your, your, your organization? What shifts in consumer behavior might we expect as well? All of these are quite important details to consider under the scenarios. And to help you with our journey, our suggestion is to look through the model guidance resources that we have shared. In this guidance, there is a list of potential scenarios and sources where you can get more information about the scenarios. You can find this on page 18. For example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the International Energy Agency, the Network for Greening the Financial System all provide science-based scenarios that you can use to evaluate your organization's resilience to these different future uh, pathways. But how, how should you go about starting this? This still might seem a bit sort of intimidating. How should you go about completing a process of scenario analysis? Well, the first things to say is that scenario analysis is very much an iterative process and it takes time. Um, it can take a number of years from initial disclosure with very limited detail to a full analysis backed by, by data sets. For this reason, organizations may choose to start with more qualitative or scenario narratives or storylines to help explore the potential ranges of climate change implications. And over time, you can start putting together qualitative information with more quantitative information as well to illustrate potential pathways and outcomes. In time, scenarios can be developed and made more robust by applying further data. And eventually, you can get to the point of having a sophisticated set of scenarios to use backed by both qualitative and quantitative information. Again, to make this a bit more concrete, take it out of the abstract, let's have a look at case study. Uh, here we have one from Alliance. Here we see that they have created a heat map showing the various time horizons and two different scenarios that they're considering based on both a two degrees of warming and a 1.5 degrees of warming scenario. They link these scenarios to the asset types that they hold, the risk levels and factors that may either enhance or mitigate their risk exposures in order to improve resilience. And this is not necessarily an incredibly detailed exercise, but it really demonstrates that the company is considering their unique context or unique situation and strategy against these commonly used scenarios. Another example that we have um, comes from the South African company, um, Sassel here. Uh, here, Sassel provides a description of the scenario analysis conducted for three different pathways, a 1.5, a two degrees, and a current pathway, and the assumptions that come with each. Very importantly, they demonstrate how this testing has shaped their strategy and provide an overview of the areas that they will continue to monitor, to monitor to ensure that their business strategy will be resilient to climate related risks. Now, again, we've sort of covered a lot of ground here. It'd be good to just sort of check in to make sure that I've been clear enough. And if I haven't, please include any questions in the, in the chat, but we have a poll, it should be coming up. Uh, the question is, which of the following are true of scenario analysis? One, it can be, uh, both quali qualitative and quantitative, two, supports the development of flexible and robust strategies, three, the aim is to predict future business performance, four, multiple scenarios should be considered, and then the last is that it's the same as science-based targets. 
I'll just give everyone a moment to fill that out. Perfect. It looks like we're uh, seeing most of you answer this question, which is great. Um, so um, spot on, you guys are indeed listening and following along, which is great. Um, I've got a few correct answers here. So absolutely, it can be both qualitative and quantitative. Um, it does indeed support the development of flexible and robust strategies. That's key sort of goal. Um, and the, the fourth one there, multiple scenarios should be considered. That is also true. Um, now, a few of you did select the aim is to predict future business performance. Um, that is not the goal. That's not exactly the intention that we're getting at here. We're looking to develop those flexible and robust strategies. And so it's about looking at a number of different possible future states rather than what you expect or want to see for your business. And then um, the least amount of you, which is great, selected science-based targets. Um, science-based targets are a very useful tool that we're, we very much sort of support and work with here at CDP, uh, but they have a different focus. So the focus of science-based targets is really about charting a pathway, a company's pathway to meeting the Paris Agreement through mitigation and reducing its impacts. Whereas the focus of these scenarios are about understanding the risks and opportunities over time related to your company itself and building resilience through that. Perfect. So hopefully that clarified anyone's questions and we can move on to that third pillar of the TCFD, which is the risk management pillar. So this is, pillar is really about an organization's approach to identifying, assessing, and managing climate risks. And here, investors want to know what processes are, are that an organization is using and how it's seeing this influence on their business strategy um, and financial planning. It's important to investors because they want to be able to understand the impacts of climate risks on a company's business model and how they can adapt to take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, this will then really link to the strategy to consider how companies are um, yeah, considering and approaching these risks and opportunities. Uh, the first recommended disclosure has to do with the processes an organization has to identify and assess climate related risks. Um, so on the next slide here, we'll see how do you determine the relative significance of climate related risks relative to other risks that you might be considering. Do you consider, for example, the emergence or existence of regulatory requirements? How might this impact your organization in the long term? Um, if you use any sort of risk classification framework to inform your climate thinking, it's important to disclose that information as well. And the second recommended disclosure is really around the processes for managing climate related risks after they have been identified. So here, helpful information includes what decision has your organization made about these risks? Will they be mitigated? Will they be transferred? Will they be accepted or controlled? How do you prioritize these climate risks within your processes? How have you decided which ones are material to the, your business under the criteria that you have selected for materiality? These are all really important questions to sort of answer and report on. And then the last um, recommended disclosure under this risk management process, uh, pillar is the process around how you integrate this understanding of climate risks into your organization's overall approach to risk management. The TCFD really aims to ensure that this integration is in place. If there are aspects of climate risks that are taken into consideration, it's important that these are really woven into a company's general risk management process. So with your disclosures, it's important to clarify specifically whether climate risks are considered a business risk and to think about their um, 
if it is material, should it be reported separately or should it be reported in your annual Main Street report? Um, we have another case study that can hopefully sort of help um, clarify this as well. Um, here we see from Semex in their integrated report, they show how they've incorporated climate risks into their wider uh, risk assessment processes. The diagram helps helps also helps us to understand the management role in identifying, monitoring, and mitigating those risks. Again, really thinking about how these pillars of the TCFD connect and are interlinked. And all of these are really placed within an overall risk management processes. And it shows that climate risk is not being treated separately because after all, it is a business risk Semex is facing. So this is a good example to, um, to consider and to sort of uh, inform your own thinking. Perfect. So with that, we can move on to the last core pillar of TCFD disclosure, which is that metrics and targets pillar. So I know uh, this was the uh, one that um, the highest number of you found challenging. So please, again, do ask questions along the way and hopefully we can answer them. Uh, but this metrics and targets pillar is really used to assess and manage relevant climate related risks and opportunities where that information is material. And in this case, investors particularly want to know the connection between a company's wider strategy and business model and the metrics and targets that they are disclosing. And in the long term, what those performance art trends are to get a better understanding of a company's actions. The first aspect, um, the first recommended disclosure on, is the metrics used to assess climate related risks and opportunities in line with your organization's strategy and risk management processes. So here it's important uh, to consider including information on a number of different things. So what are the performance metrics that are put in place to assess and manage climate related risks and opportunities that you have identified? For example, have, if you identified opportunities to grow your products and services through low carbon services and technology, uh, you need to think about how you're going to sort of um, assess and report on those revenues that you might realize, as well as what capital investing you're making to realize those opportunities. One thing here that you may want to consider um, is adopting an internal price carbon price and disclosing information about how you're using an internal carbon price. Internal carbon pricing can be really valuable for companies to sort of manage risks and understand and assess the potential impacts of possible future carbon taxes or regulation. And this mechanism can really help you understand your exposure. And if you have questions about internal carbon price, uh, CDP has put out a number of different reports, uh, which we can share in the chat and at the end of the presentation to help inform how you approach internal carbon price. Um, on the next slide here, we'll see the sort of seven key metrics from the TCFD guidance document, um, really meant to enhance comparability disclosures and that are recommended for all companies to consider in their metrics disclosures. So. Um, here we see, of course, first and foremost, those greenhouse gas emissions, the key metric, uh, transition risks, physical risks, climate-related opportunities, capital deployment, internal carbon prices, and remuneration. So these are all sort of key metrics um, that organizations consider, consider um, adopting and, and disclosing and reporting on over time. Um, The second sort of recommended disclosure really hones in on, on one of those. And the second sort of recommended disclosure is the metrics around and disclosure around greenhouse gas emissions using uh, scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions and when appropriate scope three greenhouse gas emissions and the related risks. And the latest guidance from TCFD um, really encourages organizations to disclose those scope three emissions as much as possible um, because they are quite important, can be a significant risk, and for many companies are much greater than their sort of scope one and scope two um, emissions. So 
in understanding um, and assessing your emissions, TCFD recommends looking at and using the greenhouse gas protocol to understand and report on your scope three, one, two, and three emissions. Um, and where, where possible, it's important to disclose this methodology that, um, that you're using to understand and calculate your emissions in order to really uh, for readers to understand any estimation potentially used and any, any data gaps that exist within your calculations. Perfect, hopefully that's clear. I'm happy to pick up on any questions, but uh, with that, we can move on to the sort of final aspect, um, final recommended disclosure, which is about how you're using climate-related targets to understand and manage climate-related risks and opportunities. So here it's important to explain if you've set any sort of um, long-term goals that you may have set for your company as well as any interim goals as well as those are very important uh, to consider you can think about aspects for uh, targets for reducing your greenhouse gas emissions um, to manage those risks you can think about targets that you may have set for growing revenue around low carbon products and services and again, you can think about sort of internal carbon pricing and how that, that might help um, deal and um, achieve some of these targets that you may have set. Um, and again, one of the sort of important things here is um, to disclose whether you're looking at particularly with emissions, sort of absolute or intensity based um, targets. So absolute being sort of overall total emissions that your company has and then intensity um, based um, emissions being um, emissions relative to some level of, of, of economic output. So um, important differentiation and both have their place um, and are important, but it's important to sort of provide detail about what which of those ones you're considering and looking at and why. Um, and to give you just a bit more clarity on targets, uh, we've taken again from the TCFD guidance, the sort of main characteristics of effective disclosure of climate related targets. Um, so here we see the sort of key aspects. So according to this guidance, they should be targets should be aligned with your strategy and risk management goals. They should be linked to relevant metrics. They should be quantified and measurable. They should be clearly specified over time, considering baseline, time horizon, and interim targets. They should be understandable and especially contextualized to your organization. They should be periodically reviewed and updated. And lastly, they should be reported annually. And to give us another, a few more examples here, um, let's have, first have a look at here we have British land. So for, for each of British lands identified climate related risks and opportunities, they clearly identify the so associated metrics they use to understand and manage the issue. This helps demonstrate how the metrics that they report against are directly connected to addressing the material risks that they have identified for their business in that strategy pillar. So really connecting and seeing that interlinkedness between these pillars. Another case study that we have comes from Adani Ports, gives us a good uh, example of climate related um, metrics disclosure primarily. So here we see that they provide useful data about their scope one, uh, scope two and scope three greenhouse gas emissions. So on the left hand side uh, of the graph, um, we see them reporting emissions over time with several years of data to show trends and performance over time. They also provide uh, emissions on intensity, which allows us to understand how the business is performing against its re revenue growth over time. And then finally, on the right hand side of the slide, they include a breakdown of those scope three emissions along their um, along their value chain. So it can really show help us understand where that risk exposure exists in the emissions that exist across their value chain. And um, for example, if they wanted to uh, include a target with this disclosure, they should have could have set um, an emissions reduction target for managing the risks that they're disclosing here, as well as um, 
potentially a target for revenue growth from more lower carbon uh, products and services as well. Perfect. So on the next slide, we have uh, I'd just like to share again the sort of TCFD uh, to do list that was published by the CDSB. It's a really useful checklist to just have on hand that sort of outlines the main characteristics of good practice in relation to the TCFD. Um, it can help sort of um, help you in, in, in your journey and make sure that you're hitting all the right the key points and key considerations. Um, but we have another poll for you as well, um, right before we go on break here. Um, just like to make sure that I've been sort of clear with everything. So the poll should be coming up and the questions are, which of the following are effective characteristics of uh, climate disclosure? So is it that it's specific to the reporting entity? Is it presented in a separate climate risk report? Is it prepared according to the same rigor as financial information? Is it future oriented? Uh, which, of, which of those answers are correct? Please select all that apply. I'll just give everyone a moment. Perfect. Seeing the majority of you answer the question, and it looks like I have indeed been clear, which is really great. Uh, you are following along, you got it all pretty well all right. Um, so we have three correct answers. So indeed, it should be specific to the reporting entity. It should also be prepared according to the same rigor as financial information, and it should be finite future oriented. These are all key elements of effective climate disclosure. Um, now, a couple of you did select presented in a separate climate risk report. Um, I'd just like to sort of re-emphasize, although we do understand that there may be need for a reference table or climate report in, a, of, in, a, in an end of itself that links to the, your financial report, your annual report, that helps to identify where different elements of TCFD disclosure are. But the, given that the sort of main disclosures and the TCFD is really about identifying financially relevant information, it should be included in your financial report and not in a separate report. So hopefully that's clear. Again, happy to answer and or clarify any questions around that. Um, but with that, let's take a, a five minute break and we can come back um, after the hour and continue on with the next section. Um, so come back two minutes after the hour, please. Thank you.
Okay. Thanks everyone for coming back, hopefully uh, promptly from your break. I hope everyone had a chance to stretch, maybe grab a coffee, a tea. Um, and uh, thanks to all the questions you've been keeping us very busy, trying to get you all the resources that you need to move forward on this journey. So please feel free to keep those questions coming. Um, let's get started now on how we how we move forward with this. How do we get started? How do we start to implement this within our organizations? And how do we overcome those pesky challenges that are facing everyone as we get started? So um, here is a list of those challenges that we see most commonly. So we get asked these questions um, uh, almost every session. And so we wanna make sure that we go over them um, quite um, uh, robustly with all of you. So first and foremost is how do I get leadership buy-in? And now we've been talking about a lot how important it is to have the tone from the top. And uh, we have our corporate governance expert, Relitza, with us here, who I'm sure has been typing a lot about how important that is as well. So we're going to discuss how do you go about getting your leadership buy-in from, uh, from uh, your within your organization. We also then want to discuss how do you include this in your mainstream report? We discussed yesterday, for those of you who were with us, how important it is to pull this information into your annual report, um, not just putting it in your sustainability report or a climate change report or a TCFD report. Um, the objective of TCFD was indeed to connect climate and finance. So how do we make that connection? We put them, we put them together. Um, so we'll discuss a little bit how to um, start with that process. Um, also, a common question we get is how do we or what do we start with? What do we report first? I've been seeing a lot of questions related to that in the Q&A. Um, we did take you through yesterday a three-phased approach. We'll provide another approach to you today and discuss how to get started. Um, next, how does this fit with other reporting standards and frameworks? So we've had a lot of discussion about um, moving into ISSB, um, uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so we'll um, cover that a little bit um, more here. And of course, uh, why should we disclose this information if our peers are not? So if you're asking any of these questions, you're certainly on the right track. And um, hopefully we can um, start to demystify a few of these here for you today. Oops, I went too far. Great. So first, um, really, how do you get that leadership buy-in? Now, if um, if any of you um, remember from last session or those of you who were with us um, yesterday, um, you might remember that in the three-phased approach that the TCFD um, has developed, um, the first phase of that approach was um, really focused on uh, kind of the key processes that we need in place. And that is, of course, the governance processes um, as well as risk management processes. So in governance, we really needed a key aspect of that was board oversight. Um, and of course, then our leadership, our C-suite, our managers that are um, then making sure that that trickles down throughout the organization. So what do you do if that's where your roadblock is? Because we definitely need that as we get started. Um, so um, we always um, advise companies that um, are getting started on this to do an assessment of whether their key investors are already TCFD supporters. Um, and you can do that by going to the TCFD supporters page. Um, we also highly recommend having a conversation with your investors and um, getting to know um, how, what is their um, risk appetite? What are they looking at in the climate sphere? How do they understand your risks and opportunities facing you from climate? Um, and starting that conversation with investors. Um, the, the second key point is to provide the regulatory context, um, particularly that mandatory disclosure is coming. We are seeing that happen globally. It's really a wave that's moving quite quickly, as Evan was sharing with you yesterday in TCFD 101. And then, of course, along with that regulatory push, we're seeing just a, a huge push in companies that are aligning their disclosure uh, with the TCFD's recommendations. Um, so with those kind of three key stakeholders in mind, with investors, with regulators, and with your peers, you can really kind of set the stage of what's happening and that this isn't um, necessarily a trend, but really a movement um, that you don't want to be left behind, specifically as more and more companies are providing this information. And as more and more investors are understanding how to assess this information, even if you're not providing it, investors and other companies um, will be able to understand what 
risks and opportunities are facing you by doing their own assessment. So it's really important to share with um, the broader stakeholder environment what you're doing in order to make sure you're um, prepared for these risks and opportunities. Now, once you've kind of set that stage and you have the context and it's understood kind of what's happening globally and locally and regionally, um, then we recommend really starting with um, training and education. Um, arranging training uh, for your board and management on climate risks is really key. And in those training, really focusing on explaining what is the strategic and the financial implications of climate change. Um, we've been talking a lot about how the TCFD really focuses on the financial impacts of uh, climate related risks and opportunities. So when we're discussing um, climate risk and climate opportunities at the board level, um, we really want to make sure we're understanding um, the importance there, um, that, that it, this does impact um, companies' revenues, it impacts their bottom line, it creates great opportunities uh, that we need to understand, uh, not only at the board and leadership level, but throughout the organization. And then uh, really focusing on those opportunities, identifying potential climate-related opportunities from your, for your organization can go a long way as well. So that's getting started to get that tone from the top and starting to make sure that um, it's really understood holistically um, at the top of your organization. Um, as you can see in the chat box, Relates has just shared additional resources that you can use as you're getting started with your corporate governance. Now, once we have that in place, um, we might have maybe the first couple or the first couple um, aspects of phase one in your uh, reporting um, journey um, underway. You have some processes in place, some policies in place uh, to make sure that climate is being um, appropriately um, assessed within your organization. Then how do you start to pull this information into your mainstream report? And this is really a key question we get asked uh, time and time again. Um, and just to reiterate that a separate TCFD disclosure um, are maybe the starting point for an organization, and we are seeing that um, quite commonly, but they do not support that connection of climate and financial information. So really keeping in mind that your end goal, that North Star you're working towards is to pull this information into your mainstream report. So how do you do that? Well, first and foremost, you really need to make sure that you're working with the authors of the different annual report sections um, in order to ensure that you're embedding um, cross-references or um, information related to climate throughout the report. Now, as you probably know by now, um, climate-related information um, does not belong in only one section of the report. We've been talking about governance, about strategy, about risk management, and we've been sharing a bunch of uh, metrics and targets that you use. So this information doesn't belong necessarily in one specific part of your report, but actually dispersed throughout the entire report. So you really need to work with all of the authors of the report and make sure that they understand how climate relates to their particular section. Now, uh, that can sometimes get a little bit confusing um, to be able to say that you're aligned with TCFD or to be able to, even as an organization, do a gap analysis to understand if all the information has made its way into your report. So we're increasingly seeing companies use a TCFD mapping or a cross-referencing table. I'll show you an example in a moment, but that really helps to understand um, really how much you are aligned with the TCFD's recommended disclosures. And as an organization kind of set even a plan of how you um, plan to get to full alignment. When you're first starting out, it's really um, probably the easiest first step is to use what you're already reporting. So we did see yesterday in a survey um, that we pulled of everyone that um, over 60% of the participants yesterday were using GRI reporting. Uh, a number of them were using CDP questionnaire as well. And we heard Sue talk about um, earlier today um, just the, the sheer amount of companies that are disclosing information using the CDP questionnaire. So if you're already using um, these other disclosure frameworks, then you're probably already um, collecting a lot of the information that the TCFD recommends you disclose. So 
what you do then is you take that information you've already collected and then you identify which is material to your organization to pull it into your annual report. Now, if you remember from yesterday, governance and risk management disclosures are material to all organizations. So you can already start with those. You can start with pulling in um, any information related to governance and risk management. Now, you might have to, as we've seen in a few examples, um, add that climate component and make that clear. So you might have um, in your governance structures some sustainability committees, a sustainability um, uh, a framework, or um, you might have certain meetings related to sustainability. But it, because climate is so specific, specifically in its time horizons in the future, it's also important that you identify how climate is integrated into those committees. Um, so once you've then started to pull that information from governance and risk management in, you'll also be doing a materiality assessment for the um, strategy component. So what are those risks and opportunities that have that financial impact that are hitting your bottom line um, that you've identified to um, really impact your organization? In those, um, those particular risks and opportunities, then the ones that you did identify to have a financial impact, which can start as a qualitative description of how it's going to impact your organization. For example, you can say that um, increased um, flooding is a real risk to our organization because our assets are in um, flood zones, and that, that's a good start. You can then work towards a quantitative description where you can identify really what is that financial impact um, when we have more and more flooding, will those assets be written off, how much will that cost, et cetera. Um, so then you can slowly build this over time, remembering that the TCFD does find that companies take between three to five years for alignment. So this isn't going to happen overnight, but really starting that first step, even if it's a qualitative description, and then moving into the numbers as you move forward. Um, so just to reiterate that last point, really ensuring that financial material, financially material information is in your mainstream report, and then additional information that's non um non-material to your um, organization can be provided in supplementary reports. And I've shared a few times in um, the Q&A there, and we'll also share a summary of that Q&A with everyone and in a couple of weeks. Um, there's some good linkage documents um, between TCFD and other frameworks with GRI as well. And GRI really helps organizations look at that impact on the environment, the external impact that they have. Okay, so here's an example of the cross-referencing table that I was mentioning. So we're seeing this more and more that companies are using, and it really is a really great way, not only to um, help investors find this information, um, but also um, for companies to do their own gap analysis and understand what they might be missing in their disclosures. Uh, so this company is really quite advanced in their disclosures. As you'll see, um, they indicate um, various reports where you can find information for all the 11 recommendations recommended disclosures of the TCFD. So where you see URD uh, in the right-hand column there, that's their universal registration document. That's their mainstream um, annual report. Um, and then where you see um, CDP, that's obviously their CDP questionnaire. Um, and then we also have a CR, which is their climate change report. Um, so you can see um, that they have various reports where they're providing information, and in all 11 um, uh, disclosure or recommended disclosures, they do have an indication of where that is in their annual report, and then they have additional information. So that might be in their CDP questionnaire or in their climate change report. Uh, so this is a really advanced one. We've also seen some of companies just starting where they might have um, you know, not all of the information yet in their um, annual report. And in that case, it's always helpful um, to investors if you indicate maybe what you're working towards. So when do you plan to start um, disclosing that information? Um, like we saw in an example earlier today, Evan showed at the very beginning of our slide deck. I um, always like to just remind people how to get to that um, assessment of financial impact. And these two guidance documents I've shared quite a bit in the Q&A can be very helpful to start to understand what is that financial impact on an organization. So here's a, a figure that's um, straight out of the TCFD that can be quite helpful, but just reminding everyone that 
um, we do want to understand kind of how does that impact, for example, our operational costs, our write-offs, our early retirement of assets. It might impact our research and development, um, our capital investments, our costs to deploy uh, new practices or processes. So we really want to try to understand how that impacts our financial statements and then give the explanation along with that. So these are really good resources you can use. There's the metrics, targets, and transition plans guidance um, that was launched in 2021 by TCFD, and then also the 2021 implementation guidance, and both of them go through um, how to assess that financial impact. Okay, the next key challenge. Well, how do you get started? We keep telling you just get started. Just, just start with the initial steps. Um, so here is um, uh, one of the ways that we've looked at um, how to get started. So yesterday we were talking about a three-phased approach. And as I was just discussing, the first phase was really the, the processes. So your governance and your risk management. Um, here is a bit of a longer approach, but I think it breaks it down a little bit more. And some people can find this a little bit more helpful as well. So this is um, um, from uh, TPI and they've shared kind of four levels of implementation. Um, so in the first level, um, what I really like about this is it um, notes that level zero is unaware or not acknowledging. Now, often companies can be discussing climate change or um, climate uh, related in risks and opportunities within the organization, but according to their disclosure, they're not. So there might be no recognition in your annual report that your organization is assessing these risks and opportunities um, and starting to implement um, the appropriate uh, risk management processes or the appropriate uh, governance uh, uh, processes. So really the first stage is often just acknowledging that in your um, corporate reporting package. So what we often see in that first stage is a letter from the CEO to investors, often in the, the first page or in the, in the beginning of a report, we'll see a letter from the CEO or from the, the board chair. Um, and in that letter, um, identifying that climate change is on a company's radar, that you do recognize uh, that it is an issue um, that you are um, on top of or trying to get on top of. So that can be a first point. And often that coincides with setting some form of company policy. So really setting that tone from the top can be that first um, first stage um, acknowledgement is what they what they refer to it. And then moving into level two, which TPI refers to as building capacity, which I think is really important because a lot of people have been discussing, well, how do we get the knowledge? How do we um, learn about this? Well, you do really learn by doing. There's so many resources out there. And as you start step by step, you'll build that expertise within your organization. So in level two of building capacity, we often see then working on um, GHG emissions, um, your greenhouse gas emissions in scope one and two. So just as a reminder to everyone, the scope one emissions are really those that you have control over, um, and they are they tend to be the easier ones to start to collect. The TCFD does recommend that you use the GHG protocol, um, and there's a ton of resources with the GHG protocol too, and spreadsheets you can use to do these calculations. So you're not you're not alone in this, you have a lot of resources to help you start with those GHG emissions one and two. Um, and then we also, as we're starting to calculate those emissions, a company will often um, set a, an efficiency target or a policy to try to either diversify its energy, to try to diversify that risk um, to um, costs of energy, um, or we'll see things like trying to move into renewable energies and they'll set targets. Um, so often here, we all also see a net zero target, something along those lines being set. Um, but let's just remember what Evan was talking about before, that when we do see set such long-term targets, if we're setting targets for 2030, 2040, 2050, we want to see those interim targets as well. We want to understand how you're planning to get to that. Um, and then moving, uh, once we're building up that initial capacity, moving into level three, where we're really starting to integrate this into our operational uh, decision making. Um, so here, a company um, may nominate a board member or board committee with explicit responsibility for oversight of the climate change policy, um, really holding the organization accountable for these um, targets and goals. Um, also, a company often sets quantitative targets for reducing their scope one and two emissions here. Uh, a company might uh, report on their scope 
uh, three emissions starting in level three, um, and then a company might also um, ha have scope one and two uh, GHG emissions verified at this point, now that they're a little bit more comfortable with collecting this information, and a company may support domestic and international efforts to mitigate climate change. And this could be either through um, uh, philanthropy, but often we're seeing this through their policies and working with their supply chain. Um, as we, we heard a lot yesterday, our supply chain is really important as we're starting to collect this information, especially as we're collecting GHG um, scope three emissions, we need to understand where are those hot spots in our supply chain um, and where are those risks that we need to address. And then finally getting to um, level four, which is really the strategic assessment. So um, uh, this is where, um, like the three-phased approach we did yesterday, we see the scenario analysis here. So this is really forward-looking thinking, understanding how whatever strategy we have as an organization may um, work or not work, uh, dependent on various scenarios that might unfold in the future. Um, so that's really um, looking further into our clientele, our market, um, the different energy energies that are going to exist, um, how things are going to change in the future, both in terms of, um, of policy, markets, um, our clients, et cetera, but also in terms of weather and um, what we're getting, what we're getting in the in the changes in the weather. So that level four is really focusing quite heavily on the strategy component. Great. So you all will have access to this um, approach, which is just a second approach you can use. You can use it together with that three-phased approach that the TCFD has, um, and we link to this in our slide, so you'll all have access to that. Okay, so um, you're getting started. We've told you to start with your existing um, uh, disclosures. And um, we we actually created uh, this slide and this training um, before ISSB was so advanced. So we we have much more to say now that they've moved forward um, so much on the process. But just to remind everyone um, that CDP, CDSB, um, GRI, IRC, and SASB, which are kind of those main frameworks we're seeing mostly, um, have all been mapped to the TCFD's recommended disclosure. So if you are using any of these disclosures, um, and um, beyond that, you will likely find mapping to the TCFD. So um, no need to collect um, the information twice. Make sure you're looking at what information you're already collecting and how that links uh, to TCFD. Existing information um, reported under any of these frameworks, of course, um, can be used to align your organization's disclosure with the TCFD. But as we were discussing before, making sure you're doing that materiality assessment. So pulling into your um, annual report, uh, that information uh, that is material to your organization. And I'll remind you again, governance and risk management, those two pillars are material to all organizations. So you can always start with those two core pillars. Um, and of course, um, as we've heard from Mike already today, the IFRS is um, uh, nearly um, concluded with their uh, prototype climate disclosure standards. And yes, a lot of applause from the audience. Thanks, everyone. That is great. So we're all really looking forward to um, the release of the ISSB um, general standards, sustainability standards, as well as the climate standards. And those really do the job of pulling all these frameworks together and making it easier for companies um, to be able to um, align all of their disclosures. Now, in the, in the process as you're working towards that, because obviously it takes time to move from one reporting framework to another, um, please feel rest assured that everything is already um, mapped to the TCFD. So um, I've been sharing a few links in the chat and you can use that um, to be able to see how the different frameworks link. Um, remember always that the TCFD is not prescriptive on how you're disclosing this information, but rather ensuring that a company is um, providing the correct information and the appropriate information that investors need. Um, so you can, of course, always disclose the information with your local regulatory requirements as well as align with the TCFD by ensuring that um, all the information, those 11 recommended disclosures, are appearing somewhere in your um, annual report. All right, so last question. Um, this is becoming less and less relevant in some parts of the world, but let's not forget that there are areas, and especially in the SME world, um, where this question is still incredibly relevant. So why should you disclose information if your peers are not? 
There's a few key reasons that I like to highlight here. Um, first and foremost, investors need this information to inform their capital allocation decisions to decide where they're putting their money. And in the absence of disclosure, um, companies will be um, seen as not having uh, appropriate risk management processes or not seeing these risks rather than seeing or being seen as not having um, climate risk. So the absence of disclosure does not mean investors will assume the absence of climate risk, but rather they will assume the absence of climate risk management. So it's really important that you're um, signaling to investors that you are um, evaluating these risks and opportunities, even if you're just starting bringing them on that journey with you. Of course, investors are already in conducting their own assessments on climate risks and opportunities across their portfolios. And we're seeing a number of um, data companies that are helping to pull this information out and get information um, about certain industries or regions. So we're understanding these risks a lot more holistically as a market. So providing um, up-to-date information um, to investors will ensure that you're accurately reflecting your organization and that that capital allocation can more accurately reflect your current situation. It's also important to note, of course, that mandatory reporting is coming. So disclosing now will allow you to prepare, just as Mike was discussing at the beginning, that by preparing with TCFD and getting your um, reporting in alignment with TC TCFD will prepare you for the next stage um, when we get the ISSB standards. It's important to understand that increasingly um, governments are requiring companies to disclose climate related information. Now that might be in some areas, your GHG emissions, but increasingly it's going beyond that to look at what are the risks and opportunities facing your unique circumstances. So your unique company in your specific geography um, and your specific supply chain, it's important that investors understand how you're addressing climate related risks and opportunities throughout your organization and your firm. Um, and one final thing I like to say here really is um, keep in mind that as your as your peers and other organizations are starting to get a handle on this, um, it's kind of like they're um, giving away your secrets as well. Because if your peers are disclosing the key risks facing them, then of course those risks will also be facing you. So you can learn together but you also need to try to keep up with each other. Um, so I highly recommend making use of the TCFD um, Knowledge Hub, which does have a reporting depository. So you can already start to look at what other companies in your industry or in your geography are doing and learn from them and try to progress on this together. Okay, so just get started. That's the key message, of course. Um, uh, use either the three-phased approach or the TPI's uh, five-phased approach. Um, and you can start qualitative, moving into more quantitative numbers um, as you get going. But the point is to get started and start communicating with your investors um, that you are um, starting to move on this. Great. <laughs> So a quick poll to see how you all might plan to get started. So which of the following um, would be ways based on what we've just been discussing now to integrate climate disclosure into the mainstream report? And just as a caution, they're not all correct. So I'll leave you with a moment to answer that. And I see we still have quite a few questions coming through in the Q&A. So thanks everyone. We'll do our best um, to catch up with all of those questions. Okay, I'll give you um, 10 more seconds to fill out that poll. Okay, great. Well done, everyone. Okay, so the first option was to use a cross-referencing table to, uh, to map content. 100%, definitely. Uh, most of you chose that one. And um, I definitely think that that's a great way to get started. We're seeing a lot of companies um, do that. 
not only because it helps investors find this information, um, which sometimes can be difficult because, as I say, you can disclose this um, in various different ways, um, but it also helps um, you as an organization to um, do that gap analysis and understand if there might be a certain information missing from your report. Um, the second option was to add a small box on TCFD in your uh, mainstream annual report, but keep the details on your website. Most of you did not select that one, and I'd agree. That's not the best way forward. Um, as we saw in the that TPI process, you could start with maybe not a box, but a letter from your CEO or a um, brief discussion that you're starting to move on this and, and maybe uh, the policy that you're putting in place or the, the pathway you plan to take, um, how you plan to move forward on your alignment. Um, however, if you do have enough information to put on your website, you should be looking at pulling that directly into your report. Keeping in mind, if you're putting information on your website, that might be accessible to certain stakeholders, but it might not be accessible to all stakeholders. It might not be easy to find and investors might not see it. Uh, so really important to start to pull that information into your annual report. Uh, the third option was to engage with the authors of the different report sections. Definitely. Um, so 66% of you um, picked that one. Well done. Um, I definitely think that that's something that has to be done. If you're not engaging your whole reporting team, then you might uh, miss the right appropriate section to be including this information in. Um, the final option was to publish the information in a sustainability report for now. As we saw, a number of companies are doing it this way. It's okay as a first step, but do keep in mind that that's not the end goal. Um, to align with the TCFD, you need to pull this information into your annual report and do that materiality assessment specifically on that strategy and risk or strategy and metrics and targets component. Best way to get started is, of course, always starting with uh, governance, uh, risk management, share with investors what are those processes and how do you address climate. Great. So with that, um, we have one section left in our training today, and that's to do um, an exercise together. So hopefully you now kind of understand what is what we like to see in a, in a report and how we can start to pull that information into a report. Um, we're going to go back to what we were discussing in the first half of the session today. Um, great. Thanks. Actually, can we go to the next one? Perfect. We're going to share with you um, in the chat now um, three um, reports. Um, so you'll have one from City Development Limited, one from Vodafone, and one from Sunway. Now um, you can choose depending on how much we we have. Um, we can give you ten full minutes um, to to look at these reports. So if you have time to do more than one, feel free to open more than one. Um, but maybe start with the one you're most interested first. Um, the first example is looking at governance. Um, so uh, go to page 17 of that um, report and note the page number is in alignment with the pages on the bottom of the document. So if you type 17 in your PDF viewer, you might not quite be at 17 yet. So make sure to look at the page numbers on the document. So if um, you look at page 17 of um, City Development Limited's um, integrated sustainability report, you'll see a bit of a governance overview there. So have, you can have a look at that one, um, keeping in mind um, that when we're looking at um, governance, what we want to understand really is that board oversight and the management um, role in and specifically wanting to understand how they manage climate related risks and opportunities. Then in the second example, you can look at Vodafone, um, where we're looking at a strategy component in particular. So they have a TCFD report from 2021, and on pages 9 to 15 of Vodafone's TCFD report, they're discussing um, the strategy component of uh, the TCFD's recommended disclosures. Now, because this is a TCFD report, of course, it is actually more aligned um, with what we see the structure of TCFD, um, but that doesn't mean that that's how it has to appear, of course, in your annual report. Um, so look at uh, if you want to look at the Vodafone one and then what you're looking for, remember from the strategy component, what we want to understand is first and foremost, what are those material risks and opportunities facing the organization? Um, second, what is the impact? Why do we determine those to have a financial impact on us and where is it hitting our organization financially? And then third, um, how resilient is our strategy moving forward? So is there a scenario analysis used? How does the company identify its resilience vis-a-vis um, -vis climate change moving forward? 
Um, then the third example you can look at um, is looking at Sunway's sustainability report from 2020. And on page 16, we're looking at their metrics and targets. Uh, so as a remember or, or as a reminder uh, for metrics and targets, uh, TCFD um, recommends that you disclose first your metrics that, of course, align back with those risks and opportunities that we identified as being financially material uh, to our organization. Then, of course, our GHG, our greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, for, for certain scope one and two we want to see, but hopefully also scope three. Um, and then also um, the targets. Um, and if we're setting kind of long-term targets, we like to see some interim targets as well. So take a look at those three reports. Um, take the next 10 minutes. So um, let's come back at quarter two, um, and then we'll discuss the three reports. Thanks, everyone.
Okay, great. Thanks everyone for taking a look at uh, those examples. Um, I see many of you have um, uh, shared your thoughts in the chat. I'm gonna come back through here and see if I can find a few for um, each example. There's, there, is a f there are a few people who managed to see the first example. Um, I think we might have overwhelmed their website by sending everyone there at the same time, um, but a few of you managed to get through. Um, so um, for example one, we were looking at City Development Limited. Um, on page 17, they were discussing their governance. Um, now, one of you said, um, for uh, example one, we asked, what do you think is good about this disclosure? And you said they have a board committee and a C-suite exclusively dedicated to sustainability. Its relation to uh, operations is clear. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, and they even mentioned uh, the period, uh, how often um, they're discussing non-financial information, evaluation, reporting. Um, what could be improved? You said track record of the sustainability committee regarding the sustainability. Very interesting. Yes, definitely. And what would you include in your reporting? You said you would mention um, how often the non-financial information reporting um, is mentioned. Great. So that was a really great evaluation. Um, the person who uh, I picked on there. One other person I'm going to pull on here, uh, for example, one, um, uh, what is good practice? They said the detailed organization structure, including the chief sustainability officer, uh, cross department mental team for sustainability. Um, and then what would be improved? They said successes or a roadmap set by leadership could be included. Really great. Yep, yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, detailed organizational structure and separate leadership team. Um, that is a good example that they might be adopting. Okay, great. So um, you're all um, becoming experts on this. We also felt that um, some good practices we saw here was that the roles of relevant individual committees or functions are described well. Um, we also see a visual diagram um, uh, of the organ organization and timing. Um, so um, for those of you who looked at this one, they really did identify kind of where their board sustainability committee lied. Um, they also said that the heads of departments um, were held accountable um, for ESG. Um, they do have a chief sustainability officer. Um, they meet twice yearly um, um, to review performance and the chief sustainability officer is uh, responsible for that meeting. And they also have um, a, a quarterly sustainability report from the chief sustainability officer. So they did in a in one page actually provided us with a lot of information to really understand um, how sustainability is operating in their organization. Um, some improvements um, that we uh, thought we could see. Well, of course, I've talked a lot about sustainability, but not so much about climate. Uh, so we would like to see climate integrated a little bit more into that. Um, and then, of course, uh, more detailed on the responsibilities and feedback mechanisms, uh, that communication, how it happens. We understand that the, the departments, the heads of the departments are held accountable for their ESG, but we don't really understand how. Um, so those are, you know, being nitpicky, how we can improve. First and foremost, um, I think, uh, oh, I changed this slide, but that's okay. We'll, we'll share with you the other one. I did have a good example from Aberdeen, but we can share that later with you. Here, this is an example of responsibility and feedback mechanisms that we might want to see. Um, just uh, understanding that communication that goes back and forth. Um, uh, that can be really helpful understanding um, not only that people are being held accountable, but how they're being held, held accountable. Um, and then this one here um, with NedBank, pulls in that climate aspect. Um, so um, the example we'll share with you later um, from Aberdeen, I'll just drop the link in a little bit later um, because that's also a really good example of understanding really how we pull in that climate aspect. Um, so um, here we can see that there's an actual climate task force. Um, so we can see where climate fits there. Um, and they provide um, then details of the board's oversight and explain um, in kind of qualitative measures here, um, explain what is the board's role in uh, monitoring and approving um, uh, oversight um, for climate related risks and opportunities specifically. And then they also identify this climate function. Um, so they say that um, in 2020, a new business unit, climate risk and resilience was established when group has uh, strategic risk uh, within the group of strategic risk. Um, and it was tasked with actively managing the climate related risks and opportunities. Um, so um, just showing here where climate is really highlighted. Um, and I'll, um, I'll share with you, actually, I can just grab that 
uh, Aberdeen link now um, because it's a very good one to um, understand also how companies are slowly, here you go, here's the link. Um, if you look at that report too, um, you can see that they're also um, just starting to pull it in. So they also um, um, have, you know, the overall view of how their chief executive officer works with their chief operating officer, the chief investment officer. Um, and then they pull in that, for example, they say with their chief executive officer as climate change sponsor, their CEO is responsible for overseeing climate related risks and opportunities and uh, delegates management to executive leadership team members. So just starting to um, understand how climate is related there can be very helpful. Uh, great. So uh, the next one we looked at was Vodafone. And here we were trying to understand uh, the strategy aspect. Um, so I'm going to go back to a few of you who commented on Vodafone. So one said uh, for Vodafone strategy has excellent analysis of different risks, regions, country rise risk, risk factors and resiliency planning and quantifiable figures. Uh, so that person particularly liked this one. Um, another person said for Vodafone, their strategy part is easy to follow by vis visualization. Physical risks can be given more detailed um, strategic communication is highly important for um, rescue teams, et cetera. When these extreme conditions like flooding and pre precipitation, it didn't mention those. Okay. Cool, great. So a lot of you are, are noting on a few of the good practices and improvements we've noted as well. So some good practices to note here is that material climate related risks and opportunities are indeed listed here and they are listed in the same kind of categories that we see in TCFD transition risks, physical risks and opportunities. It also reflects the resilience of the organization's strategy. So they do use, you can see those colored dots are referring to the, the uh, scenarios that they're using. Now, in terms of improvements, um, they provide more uh, narratives. Uh, they could provide more narratives on how um, the strategy has addressed climate risks and how these risks and opportunities inform financial planning processes. And um, we'd like to see a little bit more of the financial impacts that we've been talking about. So just to share a couple examples of how you could then enhance on those specific areas, um, coming back to CDL here. We can see in this table, they have the relevant climate related risks and then the strategies related to that risk. So that's really um, connecting back to the risk management. Um, it also then links to the applicable regions and of course, applicable business units. So that helps us understand a little bit more of where the risks are and how they're managing it. Um, then, of course, informing how your strategy addresses risks and opportunities. Um, here we can see, uh, again, certain categories of risks. What are the major risks? Again, the time span. Um, we really need to understand where we're, what time horizon we're looking at for that. And then this company leaves uh, the different initiatives that they have in place. Um, I really like this one too, um, just to flag you. Of course, I, I know it's really hard to read. Um, you will have these slides though um, shortly. Um, so um, Meridian, this company um, gives a really good table here that kind of summarizes their top risks. Um, but what I like to see here is if you go down the table, so at first they have the type, so a physical transition risk. So the first one's a physical risk and they look at two transition risks. Um, they also look at the scale of that risk and the likelihood of that risk. So now we're we're pulling in from that risk management category, which, you know, I did say we can't look at these in pillars. So strategy and risk management obviously do often come together. We look at the time horizon of those risks and then those impacts. And when we're talking about strategy, we really want to understand those impacts of our uh, risks and opportunities. Um, so in this one here, you can see the financial impacts, which they then quantify, but then they explain how they quantified it. That methodology is really important to understand how they got to that number. So that's a really good example you can use also. I'm just noting we're nearly out of time. Uh, so I'll move to the next one here, uh, Sunway. So Sunway, we were looking at metrics and targets. Um, some good practices was that they um, clearly linked those targets to their goals and they clearly demonstrated the performance against targets for the financial year. Now, often I see people liking that they linked it to the SDGs. We like to see those um, little logos quite often. But I think what's really important to note here is we need to also link it to targets uh, or to the risk. So we need to link our targets and our risks. 
So uh, pushing that home again, when we do do our metrics and targets, let's make sure that we are making that connection between that strategy component. So what were those risks and opportunities we identified as having a financial risk? And then we should be measuring those as well. Um, and of course, we like to always see a demonstration of progress over time. So I'll leave you with uh, one more example then on how you can improve on that aspect. So this one here um, comes from British land and we can see that they have their metrics and targets are uh, directly then linked to climate related risks and climate related opportunities, um, which they describe elsewhere in the report, but then they quantify um, those targets as well there. So that's another um, good example that many of you can use. Okay, sorry, Evan, I left you with five minutes to close out. Um, Vanina, can you change the slide to the next one, please? Thanks. Great, nope. back to nope. you, Evan. <laughs> No problem. I'll be uh, very, very quick here. So just a, um, a few different resources. There's lots and lots of resources out there. So um, please know that this trading is just the very beginning of all, all of the support that's sort of available to you. Here we have a number of resources from CDSB and CDF, CDP on accounting for climate, application guidance for climate related disclosures, and that building blocks paper that shows the connections between CDP and CDSB. Again, we have the model guidance on climate disclosures for UNSSC. We reference throughout. Many of you asked about gap analysis, about scenarios. A lot of that core information is in that um, is in that model dis guidance disclosure. Um, we have also have um, pre-record uh, videos on the sort of UNSSC website if you'd like to go back and check those out as well. Uh, but one particular one to really emphasize is the TCFD Knowledge Hub. As you can see here, it's a database, so you can search for specific company names, you can look for type of report when it was published, you can look for specific industries, specific geographies to really find the sort of TCFD examples, guidance, resources that can really best support you and meet your unique needs. So please have a look at the TCFD Knowledge Hub. Perfect. And with that, um, we're a bit behind, but I can, I think the next slide will pass on to Rally to um, go over the IFC. Nina, can you change the slide for us? Disclosure Thanks. and Transparency Program. Uh, yes, just uh, just one minute here. I've been uh, sharing the resources over the uh, chat box and the question box. So IFC has a lot of great resources on corporate governance uh, and um, uh, assessments, uh, what the board should do uh, as well. We're working on a climate governance matrix, so feel free to check these ones. Uh, we have some papers that we recently launched with CDP on analysis of uh, regulatory policies and what's happening around the world and what are the trends around these topics in our disclosure and transparency toolkit beyond the balance sheets. We have a uh, useful annexes on materiality and materiality assessment, uh, the different types, how to do that, questions what the board should ask, also uh, who should be involved in the company in developing uh, annual reports. Please feel free out of, uh, free to check them and also to contact our local IFC offices because we do provide a lot of uh, trainings and support to companies, stock exchanges, and regulators. Thanks, Evan. Correct. Thank you. Back over to you, Tiffany. Great, thanks. Vanina, can we? Oh, perfect, thanks. Um, a few people were saying they wanted to know about the TCFD 102E. Um, so please um, go to the TCFD Knowledge Hub in order to access this. Um, so the uh, Knowledge Hub is um, full of courses now. So you can learn about um, anything from accounting on water um, and embedding climate change into financial management, et cetera. So um, you can continue your learning process here. Um, as a reminder, um, you just need to fill out a quick um, survey in order to get your uh, TCFD certificate. Um, so you do need to do that um, within the next week. So before March 10th, um, you will um, get uh, the link to that in your chat box. Um, also, um, we do email it out to you from Zoom. So um, it's actually tomorrow you will get an email um, from Zoom and it will include um, the link to the slides as well as a link to this feedback survey. And if you fill in that survey, you'll get um, uh, the certificate in about um, seven working days. Okay, just in time, one minute to spare. Thanks everyone um, for joining us today.
particular big thank you to our partners. Thanks to IFC um, and Bloomberg Philanthropies for funding this program and to um, IFC and CDP for working together with us on this training program. And of course, a big thank you to ISSB for being here at the beginning and to provide that um, foundational understanding of how we're moving from uh, TCFD and building into the ISSB. Uh, thanks, of course, everyone who's been helping answering questions in the background as well. Uh, we hope to see you for another training in the future. Um, wishing everyone a great day. Thanks, everyone.